Hello and welcome to theCUBE's SuperCloud 4. I'm Rob Streche, Managing Analyst with theCUBE Research. And today we are going to talk to Igor Yablokov, CEO of Pryon. Welcome Igor, glad to have you on here. Somebody who's an OG in this and we're going to be talking not only just Gen AI, but AI in general and kind of you know, looking at where it came from and where it's going. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so why don't we, you know, kick off, I think, you know, in the pre-session, we were having some discussions and both of us, I think, come out of the same feeling, which is, you know, this isn't, this isn't totally new where we are in, from a technology perspective. There are new applications of what's going on with AI and machine learning and different algorithms, but really this has been around for quite some time. And that's actually where your company has come from, a lot of that history as well. You're exactly right. Um, this has been decades in the making uh, in some ways. So the old guard typically was working on AI uh, for uh, improving accessibility, improving safety. If you think about your t uh, texting while driving scenarios, um, to bridge cultural divides, right, with mach early machine translation and the like. So many of us have been, you know, working around the soup for a long while. Yeah, no, I, I think it makes sense. And I, I think what's interesting is your, your company is really focused on how do you make knowledge management more accessible and how do you connect disparate drives and boxes and drop boxes and bring all of those documents together. So, hey, if I'm looking at HR or something like that, I can go in and say, and I, th I think I like the demo on your site there, you know, what I'm, I feel sick, what should I do kind of scenario? Yeah, and, and this, uh, this has been a long time in coming. So I used to lead the multimodal research team at IBM when we discovered the baby version of Watson. And uh, when they didn't want to commercialize it, uh, many of us departed uh, and stood up our last company. Uh, which a year into it was uh, started secretly working with Apple on Siri. This is well before they acquired the SRI team. Uh, and then a half a decade uh, later, uh, it ended up becoming Amazon's first AI-related acquisition that birthed what many people know as Alexa. Uh, so Alexa is my older sister's name, which is a complete coincidence. Uh, but the code name for that was Prion, and that's why we ended up reusing it uh, for this company. No, that makes total sense, and I, I think being around this for quite some time and I, you know, having my friends who are out there, in fact, some will be on later on in the uh, actual super cloud event that we're having. But one of the things is, you know, so many organizations that I talk to today that aren't, I guess you could say, haven't been around this are sitting there and trying to understand where do they get started? What is the first thing? How do they look at this? What are, what's your advice? to those companies and where should they really, you know, how should they think about it? How should they get started? Yeah, and I guess the first step was uh, when when we got started uh, many years ago, uh, there was just a dearth of air enterprise AI. There was just nothing in our respective workplaces. And it didn't matter if you were attending a manufacturing plant, a hospital, you were in a government agency, there was just no uh, enterprise AI to speak of uh, over half a decade ago. So we decided to catch our own football. Uh, and the paradox with these uh, style of systems is when you walk into a Best Buy and you buy, you know, an Amazon Echo or HomePod and you bring it home and you plug it in, it has a couple different dozen domains, essentially language models ready to go out um, right out of the box, right? So news, weather, sports, music, and things of that sort. The paradox to bringing this into your workplaces is that I would have to show up with a blind trust, essentially an empty vessel that has no idea what content you're going to put into it, and yet you're going to be expect, expecting top marks on accuracy, scale, security, and speed, especially if you're going to be introducing it into critical infrastructure. Yeah, no, that takes that totally makes sense, and I think a, a big piece of it is looking at, okay, where do I start, you know, and I, in some of the companies, to your point, it's what data are you really trying to enable and what, what are you trying to get at and what's the use case behind that or the business reason for doing it. Uh, one example that I like to use is, hey, I'm the CFO and I need people to come up to speed on how we actually organize our financial returns and how we actually build them out and what our jargon is around that and our financial jargon. So maybe I build an LLM or an SLM, a segmented language model that is really specific to that 
set of content. Is that where you see companies that you're working with? I mean, again, obviously from a knowledge management, that's a very segmented, uh, you know, hey, I'm going after HR or I'm going after, you know, the CFO's office or maybe even customer support or customer success. Well, unfortunately, there's about uh, 17 different risks associated with the adoption of LLM style technologies in uh, these enterprises. And so Brian was actually designed differently. So while you're hearing a lot from the picks and shovels crowd to, hey, let's construct your own LLM or let's fine tune a model that's uh, that's available to you from open source land, we actually took a third approach, which is to only leverage these style of technologies to model language, but keep uh, the enterprise's content from, from uh, not mingling with that core itself. And that way you don't have the issues um, which uh, from uh, model drifting to hallucinations that you've seen uh, discussed all over the press. So does that also mean that, do you get pressure from others that are say, hey, well, I just heard about, you know, Llama 2 being open sourced by Meta and hey, what what is the underlying models that you're using? You know, can I bring my own model? And do you get pushed on that? Um, Llama is is basically the equivalent of Lucy pulling the football from Charlie Brown, right? Because when you actually read the terms and conditions, it doesn't allow you to use it in critical infrastructure, which many industries that many of you you know work in could you know fall under that umbrella as well. So it almost is a marketing gimmick that hey, look at this, we open sourced it, but then on the flip side, you can't actually use it for anything real you know, that supports our actual communities. So that's what that represents. Look, there's not enough data scientists and um, and uh, software engineers and AI practitioners to go around. So while some of you know how to construct LLMs and some of you know how to fine tune models, the vast majority of, of our communities don't know how to do that. In the same way that most of us don't know how to be chefs or cook food, so what do we do? We drive into McDonald's and we just need something, you know, that has rapid time to value, in that case, it's chomping on a hamburger, or in our case, it's, you know, within minutes, can you ingest an enterprise's existing content and immediately start retrieving, um, you know, you know, positive intelligence that could help you run your environment? How do you deal with just the data scale aspect of it? Because, you know, when you start to look at this and, you know, again, garbage in, garbage out, how do you deal with that, you know, just not only the scale, but the quality aspects of data? Well, I mean, we're gluttons for punishment. So we actually started with the hardest, which is uh, unstructured data, right? So these are your documents. These are audio, video, images, uh, text, right? Web pages, uh, PDF files, PowerPoints, Word files, and the like. So it automatically has to cleanse. It connects to your existing systems of record. You don't have to replace or displace any of your existing investments. It should automatically ingest, it should automatically cleanse, and it should automatically prepare it uh, and curate it so that it's uh, available to you as your own private incarnation. Um, look, because we're OG practitioners, we don't even need a single API callout to anything that the hyperscalers have. So this is a fully self-contained platform that's going to allow these enterprises to, to choose how they want to consume such a platform, whether it's public uh, cloud, multi-tenant, uh, um, which is how a number of our existing clients use it, or uh, before the end of this year, uh, private cloud and on-prem. Wow. Okay. So on-prem, which is, I, I think, again, to me, that that to me makes a lot of sense where a lot of people are looking at it going, I want to control my costs you know, hey, I already went and invested in buying some NVIDIA gear, or I have some really good, you know, top of the line CPUs. How do you help them? And as you move towards that private cloud, uh, as we say, you know, cloud is an operating model, it's not a place. So as they bring cloud closer to them, are you seeing that they have to, they can run this on standard equipment or is it, hey, you know, you have to go get an eight-way NVIDIA A100 machine and, you know, be able to support this kind of throughput. Yeah, your intuition is spot on uh, because, again, uh, our, of our previous experiences, this inference is so compute efficient, it can run on x86 if it had to. So that way yeah. it has 
high degree of, of resiliency to changing conditions. Uh, because look, the one universal constant is there's always going to be scarcity, you know, in a accelerators, in water, <laughs> in electricity, in food, there's always scarcity in the economic environments that we operate in. And so if we build to that scarcity, that gives you a lot more flexibility to deliver services, you know, where they're most needed. And it also the the flip side of of being able to operate in with with such compute efficiency is that it gets you to much larger scale. So when you look at some of the enterprise search, cognitive search capabilities that the, some some of the hyperscalers are throwing out, we don't operate one order of magnitude larger than them. We operate multiple orders of magnitude uh, higher than them in terms of ca capability. Yeah, no, I, I think to me that is especially where you want inference potentially at the edge. And as we go to, like you said, hey, having inference in the car, especially with critical infrastructure, I think, you know, as people look at auto driving cars and things of that nature, you know, these cars are not running, you know, tens and hundreds of uh, NVIDIA cards or GPUs or what have you in there. They're running x86 for the vast majority of what they're doing with their sensors and with their, what they're doing but they've trimmed the model down to be able to be efficient for that set of tasks. And I think that sounds like a lot of what you're doing is, you know, again, we're, you're bringing a purpose-built model to go and do this and do it close to where the data is. You're exactly right. And as, as um, they wrap their minds around the power of, of this new form of knowledge management, the closer we drift towards their crown jewels. And the closer you drift uh, towards uh, that, uh, the more scarcity there is, the more security there is, the more, um, you know, the, the more um, failure uh, not being an option it becomes. Yeah, and is today, are you in their own VPC or is it truly just a multi-tenant deployment right at the moment or, you know, uh, their own? Oh, we're, we're definitely headed towards uh, bare metal uh, for them. Our stuff's already deployed in nuclear reactor sites, which is a surprise to mo most folks. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we've been, um, you know, getting, let's say, um, privileged access to certain styles of content because of the way that that uh, this thing has been designed um, with, with a pretty watertight security model. Yeah, so let's let's kind of unpack the security model a little bit, and un, not not with getting into the technical bits and bytes, but what does it mean to be secure when you're talking about this kind? Because, like you said, if it's documentation and things like that of you know critical infrastructure, you want to keep that you know private for that matter. So, what does it mean to be secure? Yeah, there's there's many definitions. It means that they run the platform on on uh, resources that they control. It means connecting to existing constructs like their single sign-on. It means allocating the right users to the right knowledge collections. Um, it means presenting the answer only with certain contexts, like you're in a certain location and you're allowed to see certain things. It means whatever document level controls that you have are preserved by the system when it gets ingested um, uh, into the system. Uh, you're also pre preventing spills, right? So if one individual is not uh, is not allowed to see export control one, which is uranium enrichment, you need to make sure that as you've now transposed that underlying content into this interactive format that they still can't see that knowledge as well. So those are some of the different dimensions when you use that as a use case. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense in the fact that you know, security can mean a lot of different things. And especially as you get into a lot of, you know, hopefully the US will get on board and we'll have some privacy laws that help a little bit more like GDPR and other things around the world. And was a PIPA up in Canada and what have you. But I, I think that becomes really important that that information doesn't leak out as well. And, you know, you're looking at it in aggregate, not in, individual and that stuff there's you know there's not ways to prompt engineer around particular safeguards I, I would assume that that's a lot of what goes into your core ip is how do you really do this prompt engineering how do you make sure that the security is what the security is at different levels and there has to be a huge amount of architecture that goes around that yeah but but think about um 
there is a lot of work associated with it. But on the other side of this, they get to nirvana. So look, the the internet and the web as we know it died in 2022, right? Because we were used to doing Google searches and seeing, you know, the creativity of our of our fellow humans, right? You had music, you had videos, you had um, things that we were reading, um, poetry, whatever. All of that was was human originated. Well before the end of the decade, it's going to be generative nonsense. It'll be a hall of mirrors. And so what's going to end up happening in the Fortune 500 is there is going to be a retreat to safety where, where they're going to have to have the equivalent of their own version of a Library of Congress of things that they trust as truth so that they can continue operating their respective businesses. And they're going to be careful what partners they allow into that. right? And so that's that's what we're, we're foreseeing and why knowledge management is, is, is going to be a critical asset to these individuals because they they they're not going to have anything else they can fall back to so that they can continue operating uh, their businesses. I, I think that actually leads to a really good final question, which is you know trust and trust and understanding. Here's where that data came from. You know we were kind of riffing beforehand on you know is uh, crypto you know people investing in this now? Now they're all on board with AI and dot AI everything, and you start to look at where you know, blockchain is even being positioned as kind of being the copyright. What, what do you see from helping organizations really understand that source of truth? Because I, I totally agree that as companies look at it, they want to know where did the data come from? Is it reliable? How do you have that transparency? Yeah, you're exactly right. So think of this way. Every organization out there has uh, has these assets strewn about all over the organization. They're stuck in applications, right? In Salesforce and ServiceNow and SAP, DocuSign, so on and so forth. They're stuck in repositories such as Confluence and SharePoint. So they have all they have all of these critical resources already there, but there's a point of friction, right? In in terms of getting this to the right people, you know, to perform the right workflow. So how do you reduce the distance between knowledge and and, and people? It's transforming those assets, right, into this interactive experience that becomes, you know, the refinery that eventually powers the cars that are their their workflows. If we continue following that metaphor, so what does that mean? What does that get them? Well, now instead of hunting for for a few hours, you can get a sub second response. Now, know this: there's never hallucinations from Prime's platforms. Every solution that comes out, every answer card, you can click on it and it'll show you the exact page and highlights exactly where it learned it from. So it's always anchored to an enterprise's fundamental assets. So that way they say, all right, I trust this publicly available information because it came from a regular used website. I trust this because it came from some published content that we've licensed into the org. I trust it because it's proprietary or I trust it because it came out of my personal uh, storage as well. The big vision here is for the first time ever, we're gonna have this new knowledge fabric in the center of all Fortune 500 companies that's gonna be agnostic of human languages that things are authored or recorded in. It's not gonna matter where it's stored and it's not gonna matter what the underlying object type is. And then you get a choice of blending ex internal and external uh, assets as well, maybe from trusted partners, trusted government agencies and the like. Everybody that's listening to this should be getting goosebumps because for millennia, we've been hearing about, about the Tower of Babel, and yet it's literally within our grasp now that you will be able to take knowledge from any culture and any language and use it to, to benefit you know, your communities through whatever workflows you're tending to. And we've never had that opportunity before, and we're on the cusp of it. Well, I, I think that's a great place to uh, call it a interview here. I really appreciate it, Igor, for coming on board here and really sharing it. One of the OGs of, you know, AI and ML and the modeling and all of this NLP and other stuff that's under the hood there and that we're going to be really digging down deep into. So thank you for coming on board. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching SuperCloud 4 and stay tuned. We have a jam-packed day of this and really appreciate you hanging in here to watch. Take care. Thank you.